Owen, thank you so much for joining me uh, and having this chat today. Um, I've been very keen to connect with you. Uh, we're just before we started recording, and you know, we've got uh, quite a few things in common, um, which is very exciting. Now, um, primarily, I want to talk about uh, your book about your father and the Korean War. But before we do, um, just to introduce yourself to people that uh, aren't aware uh, about you, let, let's take us on a bit of a journey uh, and tell us about Owen. Um, well, obviously, my father was a pilot, so I grew up in an aviation environment, so to speak. It was a little convoluted getting there. I was a, a paramedic uh, shortly after I left school for about four years. And from there, I went into flying, uh, and that took me all sorts of places. I was a flying instructor. I flew in the Kimberleys, a little bit of time in New Guinea, uh, ferry flying to Micronesia, et cetera, and met my wife flying along the way as well, and got into the airlines in the early 90s. And I flew France and Australia on the 737 uh, for, I think it was about eight or nine years. And then moved over to Qantas, and I've been with them now for over 20 years. I'm currently a, a captain on the 737. So it's been a, a little bit of a journey left, right, and centre. And um, and obviously, yes, it was a bit of a false start, but even those experiences you learn from. So it's been a very enjoyable path, in all honesty. Now, um, you know, being a, being a pilot, that sounds like a, a pretty full-on job doing commercial piloting, but you've managed to write a lot of books. So tell us a little bit about some of the books you've written. Yeah, that came in the wake of the answer collapse, actually, because I, I was in the unemployment office being told I was highly skilled and totally unemployable. So I, I turned my hand at uh, other skills and writing became one of them. And from magazines evolved into these books. And uh, I've obviously written Without Precedent, which is my father's story um, through World War II and Korea. But I've also written um, a, a book titled Cheaply Do It Like a Pilot, which is management communication skills. I've written two or three books on um, the 747 and uh, the Practical Pilot, which is sort of a handbook for private pilots uh, with practical tips, all in an aviation theme. The, the first one was actually published in England. That was called Down to Earth. That was about a Battle of Britain pilot. So that was my first foray into publishing. Right. And um, and you've got a keen interest in, in history as well. And um, so was that part of the motivation to tell your father's story? It definitely was part of it. I've always had, had a passion for history ever since yeah. high school. Um, but I think also part of it was I lost him at a, a relatively young age for me. So I was about 25 or 26. And all these stories started to emerge from other veterans and from relatives that he'd never really expanded upon. He, he'd shared quite an amount with me, but um, I got fascinated by it. And it was, in some ways, I know the words overused these days, but it was a bit of a journey mm. into to getting to know my father before I knew my father and sometimes it was really incongruous comparing the chap that had done all these things to the very quiet mild-mannered chap I knew who my mother never opened a door be it a car door or a house door and I never heard him use a swear word in front of her ever and mm. yet you, you see how much combat time and that he did um, and at times you felt it was a little bit incongruous but it was a journey in learning a bit more about my father and it made the perfect match because I also had a passion for the history and and of the guys that he served with. Right, that's that's remarkable. I, I, I'm on a, a similar journey. I lost my father when I was in my early twenties, and uh, he was, you know, he was a chopper pilot involved in Vietnam. Never really talked much about it, um, and so I've been on a journey as well. You know, sort of learning more and more about his past, and consequently more about uh, the history of the of the um, of the RAAF. So, so that's awesome. Um, so tell me a little bit about um, the process um, of researching for this story and um, how long did it take you to pull it all together? I, your, your writing is amazing. I've, I've, I've really enjoyed your style of writing. Um, it's very engaging, um, but I'm interested to know a bit about the background of how you pulled it together. Well, thanks for the compliment. Firstly, sometimes writing can be like yelling down a well and wondering if anyone uh read it but it's uh, the process really it was probably a book decades in the making and about 12 months in the writing I accumulated records and that over time after dad passed and um, with those records started to get a bit of a picture but it was a combination of anecdotes from veterans uh, anecdotes that he'd related to me and then tying that in with records particularly his logbooks because he made comments against each 
combat mission. The very first few, when they had a different commanding officer, had made him erase them. And I, I couldn't quite make those out on his first few missions. But beyond that, he gave quite detailed comments about combat sorties. The criteria for me, firstly, to keep it accurate and say so the book didn't end up that thick because he flew out for 200 missions, was I had to find some justifying element in records to include that anecdote. So people had told me anecdotes, some of which were hilarious, and I'll probably put them down for family, but as an official record, not an official record, but to keep it accurate and, and in a reasonable size, I only related tales that I could find a reference to in, in military records. Yeah, and that's that's it's it's a challenge, isn't it, to keep it succinct? Um, Very because, much so. Yes, because you like you said, you could be multi-volume, um, you know, yeah. history of. <laughs> so, um, just take us on a on a very quick journey, because your father didn't have a direct route um, into you know being a fighter pilot. He uh, sort of sort of came in and then out. Was in the army. T tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, he, he, I once said to him, "What did you want to be when you grew up?" He said. Growing up in the Depression, he said, I want to be a pilot, but I might as well have wanted to go to the moon because he grew up, had to leave school at around 13 or 14 years of age due to hard times on the land and drought and depression. Um, and he joined the Air Training Corps. And that actually was what initially gave him access into the uh, Defence Forces on leaving um, or, or becoming of age. And he joined as a navigator and he trained at Mount Gambier. And then just uh, prior to his uh, graduation, for, so they said, we don't need any more navigators in Europe. You won't see active service. You can either have a ground job, uh, honourable discharge or transfer service. So he transferred to the army, um, much to the, the consternation of some of his course mates who realised the war was still going on. And then he was recruited from there into the cavalry commandos and he went to Canungra for advanced training and from there up to New Guinea served there at the end of the war, and then he was shipped out to Hiroshima, uh, about probably around four or five months after the atomic bomb had been um, executed. And he was in one of the first ships that landed there with troops for the occupation force. He came back to Australia, spent about a year out of the army cutting cane, uh, rejoined the Air Force again as a, a mechanic, learnt to fly privately and just through a a matter of circumstance, he was remustered into flight training. And uh, from there, he became a fighter pilot and flew 200 missions. But as he quite rightly said, it was not a direct path. And I think it was more a, the book at times is a story of perseverance as much as it is of, um, of wartime. Yeah, absolutely. Now, he found himself uh, back in Japan um, in the middle of the Korean conflict, uh, when 77 Squadron were converting to the Meteors. So give us a little bit of an insight into what that was like, because I found that there's a lot of people that um, they know a lot about World War II and they know a lot about Vietnam, but uh, the Korean War seems to have fallen through the gaps. Yeah, it has in many ways. I, I mentioned to you earlier, I, I think it's been lost to some degree between the enormity of World War II and the controversy of Vietnam. And... Uh, in fact, I spoke to one veteran who, when he came home, a uh, girl he knew said, gee, I haven't seen you around. Where have you been? And he said, I've been in Korea. And she goes, why? Um, <laughs> so you, you're quite right. In many circles, it, it has been called the Forgotten War. Um, but I think it's less and less partly due to the work that you do. And um, he got to Japan and converted to the Meteor in Japan, having done initial jet training on the Vampire in Australia. And it was really only a, a few sorties on a two-seater Meteor and then a handful on a single-seat Meteor. And then they flew across the Sea of Japan to um, their base near Seoul, which was called Kimpo, and commenced operations after they'd done a couple of familiarisation flights. So I think from memory, he had maybe 10 hours of flight experience on type before his first combat sortie. Yeah, that that's incredible to me that the... Um, the lack of time spent in a particular aircraft before being, you know, sort of thrown into the fray. Um, it's it's quite incredible. Yeah, and, and we look back on the chaps in World War II and that definitely happened to them, the Hurricane mm. pilots, the Spitfire pilots. But one of the um, things that did grow out of the Korean experience for the Air Force to a degree uh, was that they looked at fighter combat instructor courses. They looked at uh, expanding the, the conversion training in that 
So there were lessons learned and many of the pilots that served there became subsequent leaders of the Air Force and, and those lessons learned contributed to the modern day uh, system that they have. Yeah. Now, one of the um, one of the great challenges for 77 Squadron at the time was that they were up against uh, the MiG-15. Now, um, and when we've been doing some some research and we've been uh, doing a little series on 77 Squadron in Korea, what amazes me is just the number of MiGs that could be in the sky at any one time, um, sort of descending upon um, well, both the American and, and Australian um, flyers. It's just incredible. Sometimes it would be 100 aircraft in the sky at one time. Yeah, so we're based just north of the Yalu River, which um, was on the northern edge of, of North Korea. And on a number of sorties, when the, the MiGs didn't choose to engage, the, the Sabres and the Meteor pilots could see them swarming in the sky on the other side and, and they pick and choose when they decided to come over and they could then also retreat to the the safety of, of north of the Yalu because the uh, uh, United Nations forces weren't allowed to pursue them north of the Yalu for, for fear of um, drawing China into the conflict. Mm. Um, so yeah but the numbers that they could uh, have descending upon them is was really significant. And uh, the Americans were very busy trying to get more and more Sabres up and running. And often you will hear that, why didn't Australia have the Sabres? And, and fundamentally, what I, my reading is that the Americans really didn't have them to spare. They, they were producing right. them at a rate that was easily being consumed by their own forces. Now, the pilots, like your father, were well aware of the, um, you know, being outclassed by the MiG-15. And uh, one of the uh, uh, funny things uh, that the, the guys would uh, sing, as you mentioned in your book, is that all I want for Christmas is uh, what swept back wings. Yeah. <laughs> so there was obviously a desire, um, you know, to upgrade, but uh, capacity wasn't there. Uh, no, it wasn't. And um, uh, they did trials of the media against... Uh, the Sabre, et cetera, to try and get a, a gauge of performance of the Meteor. And up to about 20,000 feet, it, it was reasonably competitive, we'll say. But once you started to gain in altitude, it, it very quickly lost an advantage, lost any uh, matching rather than advantage. Uh, so higher altitude operations, and ironically, some of their first operations flying top cover for Sabres, um, it, it wasn't their realm in the higher atmosphere. And the, and the MiGs knew that. Yeah, yeah. And one of the things that seems to stand out to me as I've sort of done some research into the survivability of the 77 Squadron pilots was, um, you know, it, it comes down to, you know, their skill um, and experience, even though there were a lot that were relatively unexperienced. Um, it seems like there were a lot of the MiG pilots who were very unexperienced as well. So they might have had a um, a, a classier aircraft. Um but uh, they would, from what I've read, you know, sometimes they would just come down, do, sort of do a dive attack and then, then bug out. Um, yeah, and the interesting thing high. was actually that the, um, as they discovered later, there were actually a lot of Soviet senior Soviet pilots came in, experienced World War II veterans. And I, I spoke to one veteran who did um, have an engagement with a, a batch of MiGs. And he said, as you said, it, you'd see these guys making these fairly benign passes at times or keeping their distance or even flying away and then all of a sudden these guys turned up and were flying coordinated attacks and that and they went just a second this is a bit different and the records now show that they were soviet pilots who um were, were in the migs yeah yeah tell us about a is there a standout or a, a few standout moments um that your father had uh in flying the meteors in in korea i think probably the one um that everyone can relate to and has probably received the most publicity was when he was hit by ground fire on the 6th of February 1952. Uh, one of his squadron mates, Butch Hannon, had been shot down and forced to eject. Uh, it was a snow-covered landscape and it was very difficult to see a white parachute on the snow. And my father, to summarise, made a series of passes low level trying to spot if he could see him on the snow. And he thought he had just spotted a, a red scarf they used to wear on the snow. And he had pulled into a turn to come back for yet another pass. And um, they got their sights on him and blew his canopy off, uh, blew his goggles off, well, skew on his face, his oxygen mask, and he got perspex and shrapnel in his face. Uh, and he was only, he was only down around treetop height at the time. 
And he always relates that he pulled back on the stick and started to grey out and lose his vision to some degree. But he's looking at cloud and he thought, I hope that white stuff's cloud, not snow. Uh, and then <laughs> um, he, he managed to recover. He said the most obvious thing was the amount of noise. And he also remembers tasting the blood and that and thinking, gee, if I'm, if I'm pegging out, which was his phrase for, for dying, if I was pegging out, he said, I didn't actually feel that bad. But it, it was the mystery of knowing how badly he was hit. Um, but he managed to, to get it together and, and make it back to Kimpo in almost one piece. Yeah, some some of the touching um, sort of places in, in his, when I'm reading about his experience in Korea is, uh, he had come back um, from Japan from some time off, and um, suddenly there's uh, there's a few less mates there, yeah. um, and and so coming back and learning that yeah his fellow pilots and and friends you know had been downed. Yeah, it, it's something I, I did raise with him. Um, I spoke to him about you know the absence of that, and he was I think New Guinea had actually hardened him up a little bit. Right. Um, com- a lot of the chaps who went to Korea, were, were, it was their first experience of, of combat. And he'd been there. He was a little bit older at sort of 25 years of age. Um, and he wrote a letter home to my mother, actually. Uh, and he mentioned that one of the guys had got clobbered that day, uh, which was, once again, the, the term for getting shot down. And my mother was a whack back here in Australia, um, handling the paperwork for, for that. And he said, you probably know by now he's been clobbered. So the blokes in the tent next door are pretty upset, but they'll get used to it. And right. that that letter gave me a little bit of an insight into um, his his thought processes to a degree. But I think that was also a legacy of his time in New Guinea, where he was nineteen. Yeah, yeah. Now, one of the funny things that uh, that I read, he, he wasn't much of a letter writer, not, not at least not <laughs> at the beginning. And uh, tell us a little about his first letter um, to to Edith. Yeah, he. Um, he sent her back a, a, a photo of a sabre over flying um, and he wrote on the back something to the effect that the drop tanks on this cost as much as a car and that was about that was it. <laughs> as romantic as the letters got. <laughs> My mother was sending him at a ratio of about 10 to 1, I think. But, um, <laughs> yeah, so he, he, he wasn't much of a letter writer. In fact, when he was filling his logbook out, I remember as a, a boy, you didn't interrupt him because that was about as much writing as he ever did. He did a lot of reading, but he, he wasn't a... a, a Penman by anyway. So, yeah, yeah. And and um, so where did he go after the Korean conflict? Uh, he came back to Australia and, and only within a matter of weeks, he was on an instructor course at East Sail. Mm-hmm. And then he became an Air Force instructor. And then he went back to flying meteors in a, an operational squadron, uh, initially 75. And then I think he went back to 77 again. And uh, he was doing the fighter combat instructor course. And then it wasn't long after that that he um, he actually left the Air Force, instructed civilly at uh, Bankstown, and then shortly after that went into Qantas for a number of years flying the Constellation. And then he okay. had a, a very diverse career with the final 10 or 15 years flying the air ambulance out of uh, Sydney Airport. And you've carried the legacy on being a pilot yourself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it's... Um, it was always going to happen, I think. It's all yeah, I ever right. thought I'd do and it's all I ever wanted to do. Um, we often joke because my wife's father flew caribous in Vietnam. Okay. Uh, her mother was in the Air Force. My mother was in the Air Force in wartime and peacetime. And my father was a, a pilot, obviously. And so we figured that we've probably done the DNA. Yeah, that's right. It's in you know, the blood. I think, I, think <laughs> it's, I think it's just about done. Although my son, is, is he's in the Air Force cadet. So. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Now, what have you um, what have you been able to draw from your father's story? You said there was, um, you know, there's some lessons in this for us. Yeah, I, I honestly, I think perseverance is probably the prime one, uh, and but no one expected him, even his own family on the farm. I think that he would would achieve that. And there are a number of points where I think it really would have been easier just to throw your hands up. But uh, he was at Rathmines working on caribous as an engineer shortly after his uh, mechanics course in the Air Force. And he applied for, I think, pilot's course two or three times. And they, they were advertising for remustering pilots. And it was just that a seat, his commanding officer walked up behind him at that point and said, you should apply. You've got a pilot's license. And he could have easily said, I give up. 
I've applied to it. They, I don't have the education. They say I left school too early. And it was on that one with a covering letter that he never knew about that I found in the records uh, from that squadron leader that got him a shot on the course. Uh, then he went down and did the, um, the, the trials per se and whether you become a NAV or a pilot and the rest, so to speak, is history. But there were so many times in his life where he could have just given up. So perseverance is a big one. And the other one, the way in which he did after that, the, the humility he had about all of these, about everything. Hmm. Um, he, he got, I often say he had to be dead for me to write the book because he, he, he wouldn't have been able to deal with it. He would have said, oh, no, people don't want to read about that stuff. Rah, rah, rah. But <laughs> um, I think, yeah, perseverance and humility, if I was to summarise it. Yeah, fantastic. Well, look, I mean, this is a, it's a classic follow your dreams story. Um, now, it's been out for a few years. Um, you, you wrote this in 2015, 16? Uh, originally 2016 it was published yep. and then um, the, the final chapter had to be rewritten thanks to the then Chief of Defence because he had a, a posthumous decoration loitering in the records and that was subsequently awarded. But the Air Force actually allowed me to put the badge on the book. So with right. the addition of a new chapter and the, the Air Force... Uh, honoring the book in that way it was re-released in 2018 but it's it's fantastic that the support and and the contact i've made with people like through that book has been amazing okay well i i reckon it's a timeless story and uh yeah highly recommend it and owen thank you so much for uh coming on and and having a chat with us and sharing uh not only your father's story but your own story it's fantastic thanks very much matthew it's, it's been an absolute pleasure and as you said, we've got a lot in common, so I doubt it'll be the last time. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Cheers, mate.